I just want to let you know uh, the purpose and objective of uh, Windham World Affairs Council. Uh, for those of you who are not fully aware, um, uh, the objective of the Windham World Affairs Council is to bring scholars and others with experience in various fields to speak to us timely on timely issues of international importance. In the past year, we have screened Iranian film. We have had talks on refugees, discussion on China, Brazil, Haiti, and El Salvador. We have served you Iranian and Haitian dinners. We have revised, we have revised the access of, we have, uh, we visited the Axel of Axis of Evil with Peter Gabras and heard Professor Musavian on the Iran nuclear agreement just days after President Trump withdraw from it. Uh, in, coming up in October 19th, we will be having a talk on symbolic repar <coughs> reparation policies after human rights violation in Chile. Uh, and the previously announced uh, stabilization operations in the Arabian Peninsula uh, talk will be postponed until spring. On November 3rd, Peter, 30th. 30th, sorry, November 30th, Peter Galbraith will be back for his annual talk, his topic will be the U.S. versus Iran. Will a proxy fight in Iran, in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen lead to a war? Now, permit me to introduce our distinguished speaker. Tonight, Windham World Affairs Council will be sharing a light on Armenia, a small landlocked country which is located exactly at the crossroad of Europe and Asia. Armenia is one of the oldest countries in the world with recorded history of about 3,500 years. Christianity spread into this country as early as uh, 40 AD and at fourth century, during the fourth century, became a state religion for Armenia the first country to declare Christianity as a state religion in the world. It, is, it has been part of uh, many of the great empires throughout the history of the world. These include the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the Assyrians, the Arabs, and Ottoman Empire. There is much to learn about the Armenian people, including about their suffering at the hands of the Ottoman Empire during the Armenian Genocide 1915. If the world had learned about that genocide that took place in 1915, and if the government of the world had done something about it, and took necessary action against the Ottoman Empire, perhaps Hitler and the Nazi zone would not have done and killed six million Jews. And I hope we can learn more about it uh, here tonight and perhaps in the future uh, so that this will not happen ever again as long as humanity exists. But tonight, our speaker will focus on present-day Armenia and very remarkable process it has been through in this past year, its Velvet Revolution. In April and May of 2018, weeks of mass nonviolence, <coughs> decentralized and creative civil disobedience forced a uh, defunctioning and corrupt administration out of office. To understand how this 
momentous change was accomplished without violence. We are very fortunate to have as our speaker, Professor Nelly Sargian, as assistant professor at Barbaro College, a native of Yerban, Armenia. Professor Sargian has just returned from a visit to Armenia. And I know one of our guests tonight is leaving for Armenia tomorrow. Where is he? There it is. <laughs> and he worked for CIA and FBI. <laughs> Professor Satyan has entitled her talk, The Importance of Feminist Knowledge in Political Change, The Case of Velvet Revolution in Armenia. She will discuss how Armenian feminists have been working for decades toward a life of collective care that prepared the country for the event of 2018. She will highlight their key role in creating the environment in which a revolution of love and stability could succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker. I can say that I work for CIA, so. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming tonight. And um, I want to thank um, Wyndham World Affairs Council for um, making space and all the work that everyone put into making this event happen. And thank Michael, who proposed that I give this talk tonight. Um, so I do want to talk about uh, the importance. Can everyone hear me in the back? Is this good? Um, um, I want to talk about um, the importance of uh, feminist knowledge and practices uh, during uh, Velvet Revolution. Um, not because I don't think anyone else didn't do uh, any important work during the uh, you know April or May in 2018 or before that. It's just that um, feminists have been working for over decades in Armenia and. Um, there, uh, even though people use the practices and their knowledge uh, that they produced over time, um, they weren't acknowledged for their work. So I'm making space uh, for this important work that they uh, did. But before I want to um, locate Armenia, so Armenia, uh, as uh, Isak already said, uh, you know, has been uh, part. Armenians have uh, have been part of various empires, and most recently. Um, in the in the early 20th century, um, in the 1920s, Armenia became part of Soviet Union. And before that, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned that part, that part of uh, Armenia was also par uh, part of uh, the Russian Empire. So in early uh, 1920s, Armenia becomes part of the Soviet Union, and um, the other Soviet republics around Armenia are um, Azerbaijan, so uh, it's uh, bordering Azerbaijan, uh, on the east uh, and Georgia on the north, and uh, non-Soviet um, uh, neighbors are Iran in the south and Turkey to the west. And so at the same time that Armenia is becoming part of the Soviet Union, around the same time, 1920s, um, a small uh, uh, province that has a significant Armenian population called Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, uh, by a, so a Soviet decree becomes part of Az Soviet Azerbaijan. And I'm mentioning this because it becomes consequential for um, Armenian political uh, life later. Um, and towards uh, um, you know, the end of 1980s, where uh, you know, the political life in Soviet Union um, seems to be more conducive for change or people expressing difference of opinion and not agreeing with their um, party leaders and uh, the new um, uh, leader, Gorbachev, seems to be uh, promoting you know, transparency and 
um, reconstruction and stuff like that. And so uh, these circumstances uh, kind of create um, a situation where people, uh, different people who have different groups, who have different concerns, uh, political uh, interests, uh, they can raise their voice. So a movement um, that calls itself Karabakh movement um, starts uh, you know, generating force in uh, late 1980s and you know, through mass demonstrations in 1988 demanding that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Repu Republic that I showed you, that was part of Azerbaijan, be united, reunited with Armenia, and then these calls over time turn into calls for the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. So all this coincides with also a devastating earthquake in 1988 in Armenia, where 25,000 uh, people uh, died, including nine of my cousins. And um, so this is also uh, building towards the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, Karabakh movement escalates into war with Azerbaijan between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And this uh, escalation results in one million people displaced both in Armenia and in Azerbaijan um, combined. So it's, it's a very complex and painful history for uh, all uh, involved and I might be going too quickly glossing over a lot of stuff, but I'm happy to answer or clarify certain things if you um, are interested. I just don't want you to be bogged down by the history so that I don't uh, get to talk about what happened in April and May. So as a result, I also wanted uh, to show you this map of Armenia and its neighbors because depending on who's talking about the region, uh, things have different names and descriptions. So. So if um, you know, someone is presenting this from an Azerbaijani perspective, they would say that this territory is under Armenian control or uh, Armenian occupied. But if it's um, someone from the Armenian perspective or Karabakh perspective, they would just have Karabakh as its own you know, independent state. So just the political nature of maps and that they're also <laughs> not neutral. Um, and uh, so just some background information about Armenia. So Armenia became a parliamentary republic as a result of uh, what most people in Armenia thought was a forced uh, constitutional referendum when uh, the government in power, from the, uh, people of the, major uh, from the perspective of the majority of um, uh, the population, uh, forced uh, constitutional changes so that instead of, um, because the, per uh, the person, Sir Sarkisyan, who totally coincidentally shares a last name with me. Uh, I have no relation <laughs> with Sir Sarkisyan. Um, uh, he had already served two terms of his presidency, which is the maximum allowable by the then constitution, because at that point Armenia was still a presidential constitution, so the president is the head of the country. But he, at the end of his second term, he wants to um, introduce constitutional changes so that he can then be elected as prime minister of the country to, uh, you know, to maintain power. But of course, as the referendum is happening, he's saying, I do not seek, I will not seek political office again. I've, I've served my country enough. I will not do that. And then, of course, four years later, he would say, I am a, um, I'm a politician and uh, you know, my decisions are, um, have to be contextual. And in this context, I think it's fine if I am really, you know, if I'm elected as prime minister. So Armenia, in terms of its size, is just a, a little bit smaller than the state of Maryland. And it has um, around 3 million uh, people, but this number is also debatable because uh, it's hard to get the official data. A lot of people emigrate, in fact. Um, uh, so, so roughly 3 million people and half of the population lives in the capital city. This is also important for the, this political activity of April and May uh, that started in the capital city. Um, uh, and so these are also official um, data of unemployment, 20%, but again, um, un officially it's probably higher. Uh, um, about 30% of the population is below uh, poverty line and every ninth citizen of the country has been emigrating. So these are, uh, I'm mentioning these things because these are the key concerns that many in Armenia have had. 
um, over the years. And that during the presidency of Serge Sarkisian, um, um, you know, the, the debt of the country has uh, dramatically increased. And so this, uh, these are, you know, recent statistics, but the transition that Armenia made from being a Soviet republic to a post-Soviet country was also rough. So I already talked about the, the war and the earthquake, uh, but there was also, you know, the financial institutions like um, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, are coming to Armenia with a lot of Western, uh, what they call themselves, like democracy building um, organizations and starting, uh, you know, in, um, working in Armenia with those who are in power. So over time and um, forcing uh, or introducing rather rapid and wild privatization uh, with the idea that, you know, if you privatize your economy it will, um, you know, do much better. But, you know, uh, when uh, they do privatization, um, it's, uh, let's say, so, you know, there are statistics that says that 60% of those um, uh, pieces of property or assets that were privatized through open subscription that anyone could apply um, were uh, then privatized by, uh, were owned by only 2.5% of the population. Um, and, you know, they are able to buy uh, big, expensive uh, factories for nominal price. So something, a factory that would cost $700 million, they're able to arrange to buy for $700,000. So the, um, the, the budget of the country is not generating um, any revenue, uh, whereas these individuals are. And instead of investing in these factories, they are selling whatever assets the factories have for just the price of metal scrap to uh, you know, neighboring countries or to other countries. They're also benefiting, some of them are also accruing wealth through uh, during the wartime as they loot the villages that people have left um, and, you know, move, uh, I don't know, vehicles and other kinds of assets that they can put their hands on. So corruption, the endorsement of the corruption of those in power by the Western institutions that are supposed to uh, promote democracy kind of work hand in hand and uh, create this kind of, um, uh, over years, create um, atmosphere of complete political apathy and hopelessness. Uh, and while this is happening, you know, this hopelessness, uh, people, uh, politically active people, uh, keep you know working. They organize experience sharing uh, sessions. Focus on you know how you uh, that each person has power within them and creativity. And these are important to resist power. That power is not monolithic. It doesn't have one center, and you can just find the um, weaknesses in it. You know through creative, unexpected means and um, all kinds of different things. But um, the shift in, and, and you know, typically politics has been understood in Soviet uh, Union through one party, but then after the collapse through political parties. And political parties have been always like boys clubs, and so men negotiate politics with each other. It's this dirty, so this is this uh, uh, widespread spread thing. Oh, politics is a, is a dirty area, you know. Women don't need to go into politics, you know. Oh, women's place is in the kitchen with their families and taking care of the kids. And so while uh, p political parties or p p mm, doing political work through political parties kind of it, uh, hinders women's participation and particularly feminist women's participation, uh, direct action in the streets uh, allows for more horizontal opportunities and more participation. Uh, on women's part. But the breaking point, I think, in the political organizing and political work in Armenia happens in 2008 when, um, after the um, presidential elections for Ser Sarkisian, so at the time Robert Kocharyan, or also known as Armenian De Niro, um, is the president. Um, and before uh, the, um, you know, during the elections and working towards March 1st, you know, an, um, announced his state of emergency, takes the army against the people. And as a result uh, of, uh, you know, people protesting the fraudulent elections of Serzarkisian, 10 
peaceful protesters are killed and no one's held accountable. So people do, did not forgive either of them this. And so this marks an important shift. So we see more, uh, more um, political activity through civic initiatives uh, for environmental issues, for protesting against opening a mine, turning a forest into a mine. Uh, because um, for this corrupt uh, government, it's easy to give, li they make deals with international corporations and to give licenses without holding these corporations accountable uh, for their work. Or um, fighting to keep a public park public instead of turning it into a space uh, with um, private retail boutiques. And in all these, or, um, so these are the visible moments or events, political events. But, uh, you know, feminists work behind the scenes, they do the research, who are the investors, who are the funders, what governments they are connected to. They start um, writing research articles uh, with all these connections and disseminating the information, doing the protests, trying to see if they can um, put pressure through different international channels on these uh, international funders. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, but um, you don't see so much of their work visible because if there is a loudspeaker, it's always in the hands of a man. So then um, they start reflecting during this initiative was called Mashtots Park Initiative when they were trying to keep the public park um, public. So they, this is the first time they're starting to reflect on their own practices among themselves as political allies. And so why is it that we do so much work but then we give the loudspeaker to the men? Or you know, or protesting culture of violence. So uh, this is one um, uh, a very well-known human rights advocate, uh, Zaruhi Hovanisian, who's also a, a violin player and a journalist. And um, so this was her way of, and she, she's done this many times for different um, uh, reasons. But this one in particular. So she's standing in front of the Soccer Federation of Armenia the president of which at the time was this oligarch businessman who had mm, uh, businesses and was a member of parliament. Um, uh, and a military doctor went to one of his restaurants with his friends, but he was wearing sweatpants. So the guards in front of the restaurant beat him up so badly that uh, sometime later he died. So she's protesting against this culture of violence just through uh, playing the violin. And for her, this is very symbolic because violin is connected with uh, finding your own voice and uh, through, your, through vulnerability of being you know, in a public space with others, raising an issue of injustice. And so this for her is a liberatory tool, but also symbolizing culture of life. Or protesting against murders in the army when there is no uh, crossfire with Azerbaijan in what uh, otherwise seems to be peaceful conditions, soldiers commit suicides, you know, just uh, uh, many a year. And they're never investigated, they're always labeled as suicides, whereas experts, um, look by looking at the marks on the body, point out that, well, these are not signs of suicide, these are signs of murder, but they're never investigated. Or, you know, this is after the uh, second elections of Ser Sarkisian in 2012, in 2013, it's a five year, it used to be five year term. That, uh, you know, the Organization for Security and Cooperation of Europe sends ob uh, observers to see if the elections in these countries that are trying to be democratic are fair and democratic. And so this is their report in front of uh, international journalists that they're saying, with minor violations, we think that, uh, you know, the elections were democratic and acceptable, even though many local observers uh, would report that there were um, egregious violations. So uh, a feminist, Lena Nazarian, who's currently um, a member of the parliament, is disrupting this to point out the hypocrisy and the double standard of what, how they're using democracy to, uh, to support a corrupt regime that is um, just benefiting at the expense um, of the rest of the country. So I might not talk about all of them, but I'm happy to come back to some. Or, you know, um, this is actually my former student. Um, when I used to uh, uh, work and teach in Armenia, Anna Shanazan, who's also a very prominent uh, 
environmentalists and feminists right now, um, is disrupting a conference that was titled Responsible Mining that the um, Minister of Environment organized with international uh, funders. And she's offering uh, water from uh, the polluted water from the river that was polluted because of a mine tailing um, of a local river. And, he, and she's saying, well, if you really think they're mining responsibly, they're not polluting the water of the rivers like we're saying, why don't you drink this water? You know, you trust the cleanliness of the water. So just using their um, public vulnerability as strategy to point to these hypocrisies um, you know, and calling for laws for, um, so creative means calling for laws for domestic violence because intimate partner violence, particularly against women, uh, the instance, you know, is very widespread. In fact, you know, many um, end up killing their intimate um, partners. So they wanted to raise awareness of this. And every year on March 1st, there would be, again, just demand for justice for those who were killed on uh, March 1st. Um, or, um, you know, organizing participatory decision-making public forums at another protest, and this one, this, this one was in 2015, uh, against the electricity a hike. And again, throughout this whole decade, um, doing invisible stuff that is not necessarily represented through events of this experience sharing or um, writing, co-writing uh, fairy tales with kids from uh, villages where they, you know, that are torn by war and trying to make uh, feminist interventions into the tales so that the kids are not inculcated in this, uh, you know, um, idea of militarization that if you are a boy, you then you grow up to be a soldier and, you know, and so there are just two options. You can be a boy or a girl. If you're a boy, then you grow up to be a soldier. If you're a girl, you grow up to be a soldier's mother. Or, you know, using public space. Again, how I can use my own right as a citizen to use the space that's mine as a citizen, public space. Uh, this is a political scientist, Armine Arakelian, and she's just, um, um, just using the space of the fountains, uh, which, you know, lots of kids and adults jump into this fountain in July uh, on this holiday that's called water holiday. People pour water on each other, but she chooses to sit in, 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 in here and she gets dragged into a, a mental hospital and um, receives, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, beatings on her face and body or uh, protesting militarization and exploitation of women um, because of uh, the, this militarization, because there was this idea of army nation or nation army that we need to instill bravery from, you know, with mother's milk, you know, you have to be proud because you are giving birth to soldiers who are gonna go to war and uh, fight uh, for our country. So all this to say uh, that, you know, so we, uh, we're, uh, feminist women are making sp uh, space for a lot of um, uh, meaningful political change by uh, their um, uh, you know, unstoppable work in, uh, on different initiatives. But they all were connected to this being decentralized, creative, always for a culture of love and solidarity and life and um, rejecting um, you know, fear and militarization and violence, always nonviolent, but they would be dismissed you know, by, both by the regime uh, that you know, what's nonviolent, uh, nonviolent disobedience gonna do to, um, to us? There is no game against us. There is, this is an Armenian ex uh, expression, uh, you can't beat us, you know, we're stronger and your nonviolence is not going to take you anywhere, anywhere uh, as well as by their allies um, or you know, used by nationalists. Like we're a nation at, potentially at war. We can't afford non-violence. And this sign is, it is from April, May of this year. And it says the women's place is in the, then the kitchen is crossed out. And it says revolution. And this is Zara about whom I was telling you. And she shared this story with me. Um, a couple of years ago, and she likes telling this story that one day at one of the initiatives that, you know, she's holding the loudspeaker and walking down the street with a lot of people with her and following her, and her husband is in a cab 
on the same road, but you know, they are blocking the road, so it's making it hard for the cab to move uh, on the road, and the cab driver is like, look at that young woman. Like, don't you have a family, like uh, a kids, husband? Why are you just uh, walking the streets like that? And, uh, and, just, and then she says, and Rubo, her husband says, she does, she does. She has a husband and three kids, and her, and her husband is sitting in your car. And so, <laughs> so just uh, even through this uh, small interaction, shifting the perception of um, where a woman's place is. Um, so but what happened in um, April and May? So this is Nicole Pashinyan, an oppositional parliamentarian at the time, who actually served jail time because of uh, his political views and was politically persecuted by the former regime. So he decides to walk from Gyumri, which is the second uh, town in Armenia, to Yerevan, to the capital. On my birthday, I don't think he did it for my birthday, but uh, he started it on March 31st. So he starts walking to Yerevan and he says, if there are five of us, we'll do what five people can do. If there are hundreds of us, we'll do whatever hundred people can do. So they start walking to Yerevan and they get to Yerevan on April 13th. So they go to um, the state university which uh, calls itself Mother University or Mother Higher Education Institution and it has itself been used as, um, as a propaganda machine for the running um, you know, regime that they're trying to protest. They want to meet with the uh, president, but he locks himself in his office, so they're not able to do that. Um, then he tries to go to the public radio building and go live and you know, have a live broadcasting. He can't, you know, he's not able to do that either but announces a rally through different means and uh, Facebook. So Facebook becomes this uh, you know, key vehicle through, which, through which, uh, which people would organize in small groups and like, let's go do this today, let's go do that today. So they're self-organizing. And he's also calling out for self-organization during these rallies. Um, so he, ha he holds the first rally on the 14th of um, uh, April. And on the same day, the Republican Party of Armenia, which was the ruling party at the time, elects its um, um, nominee for, this is how they vote for Ser Sarkisian as their prime minister, as the candidate for prime minister. Um, this, for Armenians, this is very Soviet style, you know, ev that everyone does it, uh, you know, unanimously, and just, just like that. Um, so they were pointing to these continuities from, um, you know, of totalitarian con uh, continuities. Um, the next day, Pashinyan announces the second stage of the event, so they start civil disobedience. And part of what sustains this uh, civil disobedience of, uh, over, you know, two, three weeks is that people self-organize, and he announces this, you know, at rallies do their, uh, you know, different disruptive activities during the day through small groups. Uh, you know, 30 minutes here, an hour there, 15 minutes here. Um, they go to rallies in the evening and then they go home and rest. He actually says this and uh, his team, you need to go home and rest so that we can do this again. Um, and complete rejection of violence. So uh, uh, this uh, gets announced many, many times. If anyone does anything violent, even if violence is uh, used against you, you have nothing to do with us and our movement. And they do this because in previous attempts at previous uh, protests, you know, the government would plant people among protesters who would loot or who would uh, damage property. And so they would say, well, we have to keep the public order. We can't not bring force. So this just uh, a separation from those who uh, um, have, you know, who use violence um, becomes a part of their success. But, you know, the police are still violent with the protesters. And of course, and uh, now that it's not the people who are electing, it's even easier. The Republican Party had the absolute majority in the parliament. And according to the new constitution, it's the parliament that votes who gets to be the prime minister. And he, he becomes the prime minister. And so this uh, generates more protests. So people are blocking streets, uh, trying to keep the police away. If, you know, if they're musicians, they come out and play 
um, on the, they block the road as they play music. And um, some feminists are st uh, still writing their texts, pointing out to this atmosphere of love and solidarity and um, mutual trust with strangers. People would bring food for people they didn't know, or water, or make barbecue on the street as they block the road. So pointing out that this alternative ways that people want to relate with each other and um, relationships uh, that they want to build on love and solidarity. And it becomes, uh, it, it becomes a banner. And this is Rosanna Khachatyan, uh, I'm not Khachatyan, Grigoyan, sorry. Uh, another active participant who witnessed the birth of this banner. That's why I have her here. Um, and so just to give you a sense of what this um, disruptions would look like. So these are all IT specialists, and they know uh, how to map the city. So this is still in Yerevan. So they find parts of the city that don't have street lights, so that people, but, but have uh, pedestrian crosswalks. So they can just cross back and forth on, as long as they want. And so they're paralyzing the traffic. So all, and they just self-organize this. And then the writers decide to block streets that hold writers' names. Um, um, doctors don't go to work but are ready to uh, provide first aid if uh, anyone needs it. Or, you know, through, oops, through just physically sitting on the road. Um, and so this becomes the hashtag, reject Serge. Serge is Serge Sarkisian. Um, then there are parents who are taking care of their kids. They come out with their kids. Um, students, um, uh, you know, doctors, students who are doctors. This one is one of my favorite. Uh, so they're saying, Serge is not our daddy, we don't have a daddy. And so they keep doing this and one of them gets arrested and as she gets to the police station, as she gets to the police station, she just decides to sit on the floor with her uh, legs wide open and the police officer's like, you, this is not a ladylike behavior, just leave. <laughs> and so this is like, she, she gets to leave. Um, so it's just, uh, but also this creativity, uh, seeing uh, uh, people being so creative um, uh, makes others creative. But uh, Pashinyan invites Ser Sarkisian uh, to a meeting. He says, you know, you see uh, thousands of people are on the street. You can't ignore people. People have something to say. You come to a meeting, but no meeting behind closed doors. So he forces Serge to come to a live meeting. This is not a format that he's familiar with. He never even um, met with journalists live. He would just pick the journalists he would have a, a press conference with. So he's like, what are we going to talk about? And um, you haven't learned lessons from March 1st. He says that and he leaves. So the whole meeting takes three minutes. Uh, this angers people so much. Um, and not only that, but Pashinyan and a few team members are kidnapped, in fact, not really just arrested, but no one knows where they are for 24 hours. Um, and so then more people come to the streets, more people go on strike, and, and now across the country, not only in Yerevan, university students go on strike. Uh, but then the next day, they are released, and an hour later after the release, Ser Sarkisian resigns. So it's so hard, even for me, to conceptualize that that happened, but people who were actually participating, I was talking to some of them in August, and they were like, it's so hard to communicate what it feels like in your body that you did it, and you, you can see how like, these little things that you did in different places collectively have this impact. So it's just beyond, um, beyond imagination for so many Armenians. Um, and so according to the new constitution, if you don't have a prime minister, you know, now he's resigned, within a week, uh, then the parliament has to elect a new one. And so they question, they interrogate Pashinyan for nine hours and they, they do not elect him. So more people come out to the streets. And now everything is paralyzed, highways, people walk to the airport because there are you know, no cars or no one's uh, taking them. It's, it just, it's not possible to get to places. And then the rally, this is what the rally was like that night on May 2nd. So this is like around 200,000 people. This is a, um, the biggest square in uh, the capital city called Republic Square. 
Um, and the next day, then the head of the Republican Party says, okay, now, next time we uh, go for election, our party will support Pashinyan's uh, candidacy, and they do, and on May 8th, Pashinyan is elected as uh, uh, interim prime minister. But you know, even throughout these creative, decentralized um, methods, the way to dismiss the former regime that many would choose would be, you know, through sexism. Um, so this is Serge Sarkisian, and this is the head of the party, and this is a, a party member that was a parliamentarian, but this is the way that the, um, many would dismiss them. Or this is an oligarch who's a, parliament, a member of parliament and owned businesses, and he has a nickname that means bra, so this, they're making fun of him like that. So feminist uh, struggle was not only against the regime, but also about, uh, against the sexism, even if it's against those against whom they're fighting. So it's just a multi-pronged um, struggle. So a group of them anonymously came up with this um, um, you know, text and they disseminated it, that we're not decorating anyone's table, we're not decorating anyone's movement. We have been a driving force of many movements, even if we haven't claimed place in history officially, and we're here to um, you know, uh, upset your power, and it just goes on, and I will block the road with my car that I bought with my money, and you will serve me, you who you know, are feeding off of my taxes. <laughs> That's the ending. And you know, after the, uh, the regime change, then the ugly face of uh, you know, um, corruption, or the scale of it, becomes clear. So, I, I, I don't need the volume on this, but... Um, so, this is the National Security Service, and they're raiding one of the many, many properties of this guy, Manvel Gudikorian, who was a member of parliament, general, had this medal from the president, a hero of Artsakh, as, a, as if he fought the, in the war. He got a medal for fighting in the war of Karabakh. But uh, what they found in his home was uh, like an ambulance that was supposed to go um, to the border. Um, or, um, so this says, meant for soldiers, not for sale. So these are supposed to go to soldiers who are on the, um, on the border. Um, and instead, not only does he have it in one of his many properties, but he's actually feeding uh, some of the canned food to his pet bears and pet uh, tigers that he has. So that was what angered people. I mean, uh, they, uh, people know about corruption, but something about the scale or the pettiness of it uh, really um, angered them. But the, so this is him. And so now he's arrested. And uh, the new government has a website on the amount of um, money that they're restoring to the state budget by making those who evaded taxes return. And last I checked, it was at $12 billion. Okay. And it's growing. Um, but their work continues, so they just still work, you know, uh, trying to get uh, um, a corrupt mayor of Yerevan uh, resign. They did that. This is an, another attempt to uh, disrupt a, uh, a meeting at the UN. Um, in Armenia, uh, in which the Swedish government representatives were participating to point out their hypocrisy because they're participating on, uh, environmental uh, on a meeting on environmental pr uh, um, protection at the same time that they're actually funding a mining project called Amusar. And I really want to finish with this um, beautiful, beautiful butterfly that's an endangered species that was found and this is so uh, emotional for me because it was found on Amusar, and uh, the word itself means barren mountain. That's the name of the mountain. It sits in, the cent in central Armenia on waters that feed many rivers of Armenia, so, uh, in the central part of Armenia and to the south. And if they dig their gold on this mountain, it can dam damage all the waterways and affect um, <coughs> so many lives. But because of the, there is this new agency who did uh, investigation into the legitimacy of this mining project, found this endangered butterfly on the mountain. So their recommendation is no mining can happen. <laughs> so there's, 
uh, there is, so the government has asked another um, um, uh, group of experts from elsewhere to evaluate it. But right now, uh, together with people who have been for two months blocking all the ways to the mine so that the mining company cannot even start working on mining, um, so they uh, want time for this agency to find the butterfly, and the butterfly hopefully will save us. Thanks. That's it. That's all I can say. sense that were they uh, probably they were not products of the Soviet system right were they from universities were they professional women uh, and how did they I mean obviously the organization was sort of haphazard or but how did you know how did they do this because I uh, you know I've heard that the um, IT people were a lot behind this, but were, were, the, were these women part of that, that IT program? Well, there are some women who are um, IT specialists, but uh, not all of them. And I think that's a uh, really important question. So the women that, um, uh, that I, uh, whose uh, work, or mostly whose work I was sharing, um, they do all have higher education, but um, but it's not because of their higher education that they are politically active. In fact, all of them, you know, I started interviewing them in 2016, and uh, that was one of the things uh, that, you know, all those who are politically active are higher, highly educated and they're elite and they're privileged, you know, all these uh, things kind of um, go together. But what was, um, uh, what was becoming clear was that it's not because they had higher education that they, they were politically active, it's actually the futility that they saw in their formal higher education that they started looking for other avenues of, uh, um, you know, learning more. And so for them, for many of them, it was non-formal education. And some of them, so, so for, exam for example, Arv Pine, who's an environmental um, feminist, in early 2000s, she took uh, courses at um, this institute called Institute for Human Rights and Democracy that, uh, Armine Arakelian, the political scientist at the Fountain, um, started. So she started taking those courses at the center. I'm, I just I'm trying to hear. Um, and what, what they were also pointing out that even if you take courses, it takes a few years for you to process, for it to get in your body and in your consciousness. So but this is one way. People who participated actively in uh, Mashtot's park uh, preservation, that didn't want the boutiques to be built in a public park, uh, would, uh, were suggesting that while some came with this already raised consciousness of the uh, importance of common good, you know, that you look beyond you, um, um, and that is so important to uh, you know, practice solidarity and take care of each other rather than just focus on yourself, um, and the damage that this political um, you know, ideology of just letting everyone just build wherever they want, whatever they want, uh, can do. We're saying that you know, some people would come to support them, so they would come to the park uh, in solidarity, and then through the participation, through uh, this political struggle, they would become politically active and politicized. And um, um, this seems to be also the case, for example, in um, indigenous struggles, like Maori uh, political activists also report this from their experience, that you participate just to, uh, because it's fun to be with your friends, because you wanna be in solidarity with them, even if you don't share the political views. And then over time, like, what does this even mean, power? I have power, I can do this, and then um, they start, 
um, questioning that. Uh, but mostly, uh, yeah, uh, social scientists who could not see the use of their own education uh, in Armenia. And some of them also got education in the West and could see how the education they were getting, and the people that I spoke to got their education in Western Europe and in England, um, they could see how the education that they're getting in England or in Europe is making them as soldiers of that system. That you still serve this system in which you can go to other countries and do good and help them out. Um, it's not really about empowering um, um, the person in a way that they value collective care or uh, value taking care of each other. So Sorry, that's kind of... A follow-up question? Yeah. Because I think in the past, many of these people would have gone to the West and, and stayed, right? Well, some uh, people stayed in that. It seems that this time they've either come back or they, they're not ready to do that. So many, so uh, the people that I was speaking to, they would also say actually emigration is a political statement. It's not, um, it's not uh, nothing. They're trying, people who leave Armenia, who don't want to live here, are telling us something. They're just uh, saying that this place is not worth my life or my effort. And all of those people that I spoke to, they're like, I want to live here and uh, I want to live um, a life that, uh, uh, that is good for not only my well-being, but uh, you know others, and we can do this in harmony, not at the expense of uh, someone else, or not exploiting each other, not exploiting nature, and all this not uh, living with others, uh, not exploiting each other, not exploiting nature, has been like this running theme through uh, whatever they're engaged in. May I see how many questions do you have, please? Raise your hand. Those who have questions. One, two, three, four, five, six. So, an impolite request, please make your question brief and concise so she can address everybody's uh, questions. Okay? First one. Okay, we have right here. Um, so, what, what's going to fuel the economy? What's the, what's the industry? What's, is it agriculture? Is there industry? What, how is it going to be able to prosper as a country? So this is a really uh, great question because right now the new um, government and even you know uh, Pashinya still likes going to rallies um, and uh, you know in August I was there it was his hundredth day in office he said you know power belongs to you let's meet in the Republic Square so it just you know there was a rally and um, but what is coming through in in, in his project is uh, you know we're restoring money that was stolen from the budget of the country invest in Armenia, there are not going to be m m um, monopolies, but I didn't hear anything about redistribution of resources. So that part, um, I don't know, it's, it's still very neoliberally oriented. And um, in fact, his government is uh, talking about, um, oh, they, they talked about this in the US also, you know, coming with this uh, one tax for everyone, irrespective of the income level. Flat tax, thank you. That's exactly, I think, uh, what they're calling in Armenia also. Um, but most jobs have been in service area, if that's what uh, you're asking, some in agriculture and even smaller percentage in um, industry. But I don't think that part is clear uh, what will fuel the economy, at least that they are clearly articulating, other than we're just going to restore every single cent that was stolen from our budget, invest and, you know, you know, there is no corruption, will create uh, an atmosphere in which you can do business well. So he's, that's so, uh, so, so far. So feminists are very weary, for example, with, uh, about this neoliberal direction or the flat tax or, you know, no mention of redistribution of resources or, um, you know, raising salaries or, you know, pensions and things like that. Yes, right here. Yeah, Eric. Well, um, I sort of have two questions, I'm hoping one of them can be fairly brief. Um, I'm wondering why it's called, it's been called the Velvet Revolution, and I'm also wondering how you think some of these ideals or values can sustain itself further than just this year? Like, how do you see 10 years down the line, like, this kind of um, 
enthusiasm or this yeah. kind of spirit might sustain itself? So, um, it, uh, it started with Pashinyan himself, the person who's uh, the interim prime minister right now. Um, and uh, the, way, the way that Velvet Revolution has been used by those who, who became the most visible faces of the movement was that it was non-violent, not um, a life was lost, so, uh, and it was achieved through um, uh, non-violent civic disobedience. And it's important because there are women on his team who have actually done that kind of work for years, and one of them was Lena Nazarian that I mentioned, the, the, the person who disrupted OSCE um, um, observer's report. She's had a lot of experience. Um, the, um, the person who's the Minister of Culture uh, right now, she has a lot of experience. She actually went to specific camps for non-violent political change or non-violent uh, civic, um, uh, civil disobedience. Um, but, you know, you don't... So they provide the knowledge and it's applied at mass scale, but you don't see them so much. But um, it's interesting that even though in many people's lives uh, nothing has changed on a daily basis yet, there was so... Um, this, um, the hopelessness has been so heavy and so... Um, um, damaging for overall well-being that now that that's lifted people uh, f uh, feel, uh, you know, feel hopeful and particularly women that you know you write many of them um, were uh, children during the 80s um, there are a few people who have been uh, active and remember their experiences in Soviet Union but many were children so their um, their experiences were through the what we call in Armenia dark years of early 90s you know two hours of electricity a day and stuff like that um, but uh, so so fem many different feminists and again you know when I say feminists they, they come from very different uh, political uh, agendas and many of them don't even agree with each other uh, that for example someone wrote an article saying we know people, uh, women are over 50% of our population and it's not acceptable that there are only two ministers that are women. There is no real change in Armenia without women's full participation. And another uh, feminist was like, can you believe she wrote that? You know, just like, why would you even bother? So they have different perspectives. And the way forward is seen in different ways. But what they want to do is make constitutional changes, make changes to the electoral code, so that uh, um, elections can actually be uh, fair. And um, there was uh, something else that was, so make uh, uh, these kinds of changes, but also see how they can um, reform the uh, judiciary. Because before they would re receive phone calls from the prime minister or the president, this is what you need to do, this is the decision the court needs to pass. Now they don't receive the calls, but those who are from uh, former regime, uh, you know, are in touch with the judges. And so they're trying to figure out how to also, um, um, and now, you know, on his 100th day rally, Pashinyan and his team members were talking about um, transitional justice, but not in the way that transitional justice is understood um, in um, you know certain parts of the world. Um, so that's their vision. So I guess it would depend on whose perspective, you know, who you're asking. Yeah. Cyrus. Oh, thanks. Great, great, great presentation, Nelly. Thank you so much for enlightening us on this uh, great, very interesting revolution. Um, my question was, uh, do you think? What percent of, of Armenian women who would be uh, comfortable just saying to their spouses, their children, their friends, I am a feminist? And, and is there a word in Armenian for feminist? It, it, what, how does that word sound? Does it sound feminist. like a... You would say feminist. So it's, not a, it's, it's sort of an imported word maybe yeah. from, from Western Europe, right? Yes. So is this concept of feminism uh, in, in some way similar to, let's say, an American concept of feminism? Is it a different concept? Mm -hmm. and, and uh, do you see that growing? Do you see more women uh, in the next 10 years, let's say, uh, proudly calling themselves feminists in Armenia, mm -hmm. or is that going to be a slower process? Uh, thanks. That's actually really also a great question. Um, so many feminists, uh, what they've been doing over the past, uh, you know, a decade and a half, or you know, longer than the decades, 
have been um, um, actually revisiting the archives and reviving Armenian feminists from the 19th century, early 20th century, whether this is through their uh, um, articles that they published or poetry and doing all kinds of creative work with it, uh, revival. The word feminist is still, uh, you know, thought of as this um, uh, man-haters in, in the general public or that uh, they're just like, uh, also because of this, um, the way that the rhetoric of the former governments of you know Western contamination. So the feminism is one of those, and just uh, asking for um, or uh, demanding that all citizens, despite their um, sexuality or gender identification, be regarded um, in the same way. Western contamination. So they have used, uh, they have tried to manipulate these things against the wider population, so many people have internalized these things. So what they try to do is focus on practices. So those who do self-identify as feminist and have a feminist um, uh, um, agendas of you know, fight against domination, against sexism, but also all kinds of intersecting um, dominations. So they focus on practices, on um, uh, you know, questioning um, what you learn as you grow up, that you know, your brother's never gonna clean their plate or ne is never gonna do the dishes, but you have to do the dishes because you're a girl um, and things like that. So, but more and more people but through focusing on practices and then others claiming this word, but in a way that is socio-politically and culturally relevant, it start, it's making more space for that. Yeah. 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 Hi, I'm curious about the enduring temptations of Nagorno-Karabakh. So this enduring conflict allows opportunities to uh, exacerbate nationalism and pre present the persistent national security dilemma. That yeah. was the case prior to revolution. How yeah. is it playing out with the current government? Um, so the current government um, is still, um, I, I wanted to show this the last uh, clip, uh, is still, so for example, in the previous, uh, the, the children of the, pre uh, the previous government members, uh, none of them served um, in the army. And so in Armenia, if you're a man of 18, uh, you know, you're, you perceive that you're a man and then you have to go to the army. If you go to a university, then if you're, when you're done with the university, then you go to army. But most government officials or their affiliates or oligarchs uh, would find, uh, you know, forge documents that their kids have, I don't know, migraine headaches or foot pain or whatever it is to avoid this. So Pashinyan's son was of age, you know, he finished university and he very publicly said, you know, I would like my son to go to Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, and, and, so that's the place that people don't want their kids to go. It's typically uh, the socially most vulnerable people's uh, children who end up uh, going there because they don't have the, you know, the begging of their parents. And so mostly they are the ones who are dying on the border. So according to Pashinyan, he's sending his son to Karabakh because he's interested in peace. Because why would I send my uh, son to the uh, to um, the most uh, you know dangerous border if I am preparing for war? Um, but for Armenian feminists, you know, they, and for years they have been wanting to talk about peace. Why can't we talk about peace? And many of them have been doing these projects with uh, their Azerbaijani counterparts, women, you know, sh sharing our stories or telling our stories or making film on how militarization is really damaging for people's uh, lives and particularly uh, women's. Um, and the Nagorno-Karabakh issue has always been used to suppress any sort of revolt or dissent or um, a complaint or dissatisfaction. We are a country at war. Our security is important. But so that, um, that rhetoric of security uh, was not there during April and May. In fact, human rights uh, advocates said uh, their hotlines for sexual assault and intimate partner violence were silent on those days. So there's all these connections of what changes when we change our relationship to each other, when we're actually focusing on life and love and solidarity rather than fear and death, how that affects our relationships. But I don't think his politi he, um, politics is much more different than 
um, that we're preparing, we want peace, but if you're gonna, um, uh, you know, uh, shoot at us, we'll shoot back at you. In fact, right now, there are these um, uh, drills, yeah, and that um, the conditional at war status in Armenia, and um, by former governments, there was this, um, I don't know what the word is, but um, the decree or uh, thing that, uh, that was sent to all the schools to have uh, clubs where kids are growing to be, you know, patriotic and uh, dedicated to the army and they, they would have this camouf camouflage and s uh, sing patriotic, you know, military songs and stuff like that. The new government, re uh, you know, took that back. And yet, two days ago, the, the new uh, Minister of Education and uh, Education and Science sent, uh, um, again, I, I'm forgetting the word, it's not exactly a letter, but it's like a, you gotta do this kind of command uh, thing, I don't... Directive. directive, thank you. Sent a directive to all schools, you know, why don't you teach kids some patriotic songs, or ask them to write letters to the soldiers to bolster their, um, you know, confidence. Write letters to soldiers. So that hasn't changed much, but that's one of the things that feminists have also been fighting because when they talk about why can't we talk about peace, they would say, you know, you're just there's an expression in Armenian, you're um, you're pouring water on the Turks' mill, and you know Azerbaijanis are um, equated with Turks and Turks with genocide, you know, just all these um, enemies, and so to dismiss this desire to talk about peace. Uh, I'm curious about the role of the church um, yeah. in all of this, and particularly as you're trying to um, change views um, toward women, and how that might be playing out in the, I'm assuming it's mostly public education in Armenia, as opposed to church and private education. And also I'm interested if there's abortion available in yes, Armenia, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, legacy yeah, of the Soviets. Yes. But then secondarily, um, uh, did Pashayan have contact with the exile community? How? What is the role of the exile community? Yeah, yeah. Has it been funding um, some of these efforts? Oh, so uh, thanks for actually asking that question. Uh, another thing that um, those uh, who, again, became the key faces of the movement wanted to make clear, and Pashinyan himself, that this is not a geopolitical issue. This is an uh, issue internal to Armenia. There, is n there are no uh, outside agents involved, no big brothers, big, you know, um, in, uh, Russia's not involved, US is not involved, Europe is not, this is our business, we have to clean up our house. So that was their stand. Um, so there is the Ministry of Diaspora in Armenia. So it just uh, manages the relationship with Armenians in other countries. Uh, and before the approach was that everyone, you know, come to Armenia, and there was even a program called uh, Come Home. Um, even though, you know, many of them, uh, first of all, uh, the Republic of Armenia has never been a place where they grew up, their parents grew up, their grand great grandparents grew up, they are. Uh, families, are, they're descendants of people who came from other countries and, you know, survivors of genocide. Um, so it was always like, uh, you know, just invest in Armenia, come to Armenia, give money to Armenia. So there was this resentment in many diaspora communities that they were like a cow that you want to milk. Um, but then also um, critique uh, from people working and living in Armenia who were politically active that the diaspora organizations were complicit in the, um, you know, because they were working with this corrupt government instead of just putting pressure. If you want us to invest, you need to do certain things. Um, but, um, and that's an interesting because the new uh, minister of the diaspora is 28 years old. And I was thinking, what must it be like, you know, to grow up in a patriarchal society and have that kind of confidence as a man that you're at 27 and someone's like, you're going to be the, do you want to be the minister of diaspora? And I'm like, sure, I can do that. Um, because um, I couldn't say that at 43, you know. Um, but so, uh, but he's working actually um, with people who have studied uh, diasporas and in, uh, in fact one of my colleagues and it's changing the policy or approach to the diaspora so it's not at least 
right now they're saying it's not going to be you know everything uh, for Armenia but what is it that we can do you know uh, for different diaspora communities and it's not our business how diaspora communities manage their own internal politics or or life but how can we make this a, a more a two-way relationship uh, you know uh, rather than you just give your money to us or come to us because this is your home you owe to us was there anything else you asked the church. Oh, the church, yeah. So the church is an ongoing um, issue, but then there are some, um, you know, there are sometimes, um, uh, in the, as an institution, it's very patriarchal and uh, uh, wants to put women in their place, um, but then there are individual priests who are not um, necessarily following. And in fact, a group of, and you know, the, the head of the Armenian church, the Catholicus, um, has been, you know, on excellent terms with all the past regimes, and he himself owns, you know, owns properties. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's as corrupt as um, his um, secular counterparts. Um, and a group of people tried to uh, demote him, but they used the church rules against this group that, you know, a Catholicos is appointed for life, and you know, you can't do anything about that. They don't, but they started in the post-Soviet years. They started this um, history of religion, and you know that's uh, actually you reminded me of something. So and so they're teaching the history of religion in Armenia, and the focus is very much on Armenian Apostolic Church at the expense of other kinds of belief systems. Um, but also there was a footnote in one of the books that said, in I don't know Middle Ages there were these. Um, <coughs> Uh, there was this group of pro Protestant uh, Armenians, uh, Tondrakians, and they were a small but potent group and generated support. And the church called the, the, all the books back, got rid of the footnote, and so, so, so sanitized, cleaned up, put just the, um, the history of uh, Christianity, which was very bloody at the, you know, initially. It was not a, um, a peaceful uh, way of you know, we have a message of light for you, and then like, you're welcome. That did not happen, you know, just... Um, so, but sanitizing and uh, focusing on the importance of the Armenian church, if, you are, if you're Armenian, and no revolts, no protests, yeah. I got a mic for you. Oh. I, I'm trying to, if this is right or not, but Brattleboro has a connection with Armenia a couple of two, three, four years ago, there was a restitution program, a social justice program, and a lot of Armenians came in and got trained in it and went back and had extraordinary success. Does that ring a bell? Um, not to me, no. but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means I don't know. There's something that was, was here. There was a training program in where, where um, reconciliation with restitution mm -hmm. for people who were wronged, mm -hmm. and it's been used in the schools with, you know, well, sort of a amount of success. And they brought it back with like 90%. Everybody, everybody was trained there, like mm -hmm. almost all the teachers. I'm, anybody remember that a few years back? What's that? Restitution. Yeah, it was like if, if somebody is, um, has, has uh, um, been, been bad to somebody, you get the people together to have a uh, Reconciliation. Restorative justice, I mean, yeah. Well, thank you, restorative justice. Oh, restorative justice. So yes. the, the, thank this you. kind I of, yes, word. yes, yes. Because, uh, because there, there have been you know, different efforts of uh, reparations and what that would look like. But um, yes, so many um, uh, programs like that have happened. And the families that I know also, when they're weaving, uh, you know, they call the program Beyond Borders. So they're trying to weave stories. Uh, with, with uh, people that they would maybe, uh, so it's basically saying why are you putting borders and making me hate someone whom I would otherwise uh, maybe share views with. And so they uh, work with uh, different women from Turkey and Azerbaijan and uh, weave their uh, stories together. Any other questions? I have one more. Uh, so on the map, uh, Azerbaijan was on either side. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah. Yes, that's um And again, depending on who you ask, because history is tricky in this uh, part of the world. 
Um, so Armenians um, I would say that it was historically Armenian. It was also um, um, annexed to Azerbaijan. You know, there there's um, there were remnants of Armenian um, cemeteries, and there was this big. Uh, thing about the cemeteries being destroyed by the government to get rid of all the um, uh, um, evidence that there once were Armenians there, but then Azerbaijanis would uh, um, consider this as part of their history. But um, Armenians from this part of Azerbaijan um, left or went to other places, so it did not maintain this um, identification with the place and uh, ability to uh, put claim on it that Nagorno-Karabakh did, so that they had different, uh, basically, roots. But if I could add something, if I come to Iran, um, just to let you know that there are some two and a half million yes. Armenian in Iran, and uh, we were honored to have that part of our history. In 1920, the Iranian king opened the door. Any Armenian could come to Iran from any border without visa, without passport, and now they came to Iran and they developed the Iranian economy that we are enjoying today. They are the best engineers, the best mechanics, the best everything, and uh, they just walked in either through Azerbaijan or right here. This is the Iranian border. Yes. From here. And uh, they are still there, and they are key force in the Iranian economy. And, uh, but, uh, you know, Azerbaijanis are the biggest minority in Iran, too, right? They yeah. are, but the Armenian speak Armenian, yes. have the Armenian yeah. school, yes. and the most beautiful churches in Iran. Okay. By the way, this is the minister of the diaspora. So. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it, I think, a well-known fact that Ishaq's favorite Iranian pop singer yes. is Armenian? That's right. That's right. So. And for your information, I gave her is Vigen, That's right. Vigen, who actually made Western music, national music in Iran. And I am happy to bring her a CD of Vigen as a gift. <laughs> among <laughs> among Thank other you. gifts we have for her. <laughs> so Thank if you. there are no other questions, then let us thank our speaker. Thank you so much. Here is our little gift from Vermont that we give to our speaker and thank you, thank you for coming. Enjoy yourself, drive home safely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank